Okay, uh, welcome. Uh, this is the brown bag of the DSI Community Democracy, and I'm very, very happy to welcome Sanjana Hatutuba today, who's joining us from New Zealand, actually, so it's early in the morning for him. And uh, Sanjana has agreed to talk about ecosystems of cohesion and rupture. Uh, I actually have known him for quite a long time when I was doing my own PhD. I think we crossed paths for the first time in, in Zurich. And since then, uh, you've been uh, lately on the other side of the, the continent. And I'm very happy that you can be here and talk today about uh, kind of the disinformation, what you call the infodemic. Uh, and from a South Asian perspective, which is something that actually in our kind of uh, sphere and our kind of discourse often gets uh, neglected a bit. So I'm very happy to have you here. Um, we'll have about ha half an hour, 40 minutes uh, of presentation. And afterwards, we'll have an open Q&A session. I'm very happy we're also having quite a few guests from outside of uh, the University of Zurich joining us. So welcome, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Carsten, for that very kind introduction. And thank you all for joining. Um, I certainly don't intend, intend to take 40 minutes. Um, but I did want to talk to you a bit about what some of you have, but obviously haven't had the time to read, which is my PhD thesis and some of the main points covered in that, that touch on some aspects that I think all of us are dealing with in our respective work environments around the world. So while it will be from the thesis, thesis it will not be solely located in Sri Lanka. Um, just wanted to place for consideration some of what I had discovered. Um, for those who don't know, I went into my PhD in 2018 after around 15 plus years of working in the field. I've been with the ICT for Peace Foundation since 2006. So the PhD for me was more a process of reflection as opposed to what some others may go in for a PhD program for. Um, and in that sense, it was looking back at uh, over well over a decade of work in the country and around the world, dealing with the fallout of social media and the consequences of the unbridled growth. Uh, hacking is what the term that they use, what Facebook used, um, this, this interest in, in growing a user base as opposed to principles and policies and ethics and guidance around that growth in contexts like where I came from. Um, and I suppose that's a good start as any to that, that slide, which is actually a, a marker, it's from India. But uh, for any of you who've been to South Asia and you go to a market, it's an absolutely confusing place and disorienting. Um, it has its own logic. Uh, it's a cornucopia of smells and sights and sounds and colors, sometimes even cows. Um, and then you get sometimes very frightened and you tend to go away, which is a great pity because markets are some of the most beautiful and vibrant of all the places that you can go to in the subcontinent. Um, and it has its own logic uh, and you have to understand it in, in its location and its context. Um, you can't study a market from a PowerPoint slide. It's as absurd as trying to learn to swim or to cycle from a keynote or PowerPoint. You have to be in it. You have to be located in it. And, I, and, I, and I, that's what I bring to um, the table. Um, Carsten, Daniel, and I have often talked about uh, Frances Haugen and how much the West was interested in what she had to say as a whistleblower over the course of uh, late 2020 to 2021. Um, for most of us in, 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 in South Asia and other parts of the world, Haugen didn't say anything that we didn't know and had been enduring for well over a decade. And I always say that the, uh, the patina of my skin, the melanin, um, in a sense, is etched with uh, all of us. It's, it's etched with having to negotiate the consequences of social media harms in our part of the world. Uh, in our markets, as it were, metaphorically and literally. So context really matters. Um, and it's something that I really don't see often enough in the coverage of um, and the studies of social media around the world. Um, because your Facebook and Twitter and YouTube is very different to my YouTube and uh, Facebook and Twitter and TikTok. 
Um, the branding might be the same, but the product and the algorithms and the platform operate in very different ways. Um, time, uh, electoral moments, when social media is, is used, by whom, in what language, um, all of these matter. So all of this is stuff that I've actually gone to in some depth in my PhD. And the other thing is that, uh, well, I mean, gender obviously matters a huge deal, um, including LGBTIQ plus people and how they uh, face harms and how they negotiate and navigate social media um, for the good and as well as for the bad. Uh, but the one thing that I always try to stress is that um, very often data scientists, and I don't mean to hurt anybody on this call, there is a uh, interest in more and more and more and more data. Um, and that's sometimes an unhealthy interest because what I always say is that um, Sanjana Hattotua is more than a row and a column and is more than the sum of the metrics. Um, very often we tend to conflate metrics and data with the lives of people. And we tend to project onto the lives of people and embody them to be what the data tells us they are. And that can be very, very dangerous because Carsten and Daniel and Maria and everybody on this call are much more than the sum of the data points combined. We are richer, we are more complex creatures. And that's something that a lot of data scientists as well as social media companies don't quite understand because we said we tend to see them as data subjects, not as embodied selves. So my research was locating the embodied self and also using big data. The other thing is actually, I mean, it might sound banal, but it, <laughs> suppose it sounds a bit erudite once you have a PhD, is that it's all very complicated. Um, and the enunciation of the complexity is also fighting back against a narrative that says it's all very simple and these things can be simply addressed, either through regulation or you tweak a bit and the algorithm sorts itself out or you change the head of a company, uh, or you um, hire a new person for a particular product or context or country or community, and then everything will sort itself out. In fact, these are very, very complicated systems, both human and technical. And it really um, fights against um, your understanding of it, even if you are from the same context. And that's actually quite quite an interesting thing because even if you're well versed with and have come from that context, uh, social media really complicates uh, relationships on social media and relationships offline, even when you're not connected to those social media platforms because social media impacts not just those on it, it impacts all of society, whether you're on it or not. Uh, and so the traditional ways of looking at society and polity uh, will be it in terms of media or political parties or the Westphalian state, as it were. We're not in a post-Westphalian state, but intra and interstate relationships as a consequence of being undergirded by today's social media frameworks and um, connections uh, is, is a very, very complicated thing. Um, and that is really the foundation. I mean, there's no going back to the halcyon days of... Uh, broadcast television and just print media. Uh, so that's something that we have to acknowledge. And in my part of the world, actually, it tends to be more complicated than in Europe or the global north because of the sheer, sheer plethora of uh, tools and apps and services and products and platforms that we use that by, by order of magnitude on, 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 on any given week is greater than, than what the uh, average Swiss would be comfortable using or even no exists. Um, the, the other point is that uh, misinformation and disinformation and harms are rife. There's no getting over it or saying that uh, it doesn't exist. I love when Facebook every year, um, I, need, I mean, they try. Um, and at my most charitable, I like that they try, but I love it when they say uh, misinformation or disinformation is 0.1% of the entire platform. And you know, these are meaningless figures because they don't ever ground it. It makes fantastic uh, headlines, obviously, and sound bites. But 0.1% of what and where and who is producing these things in what language? You know, these are never things that are really clarified. And 
you know, when you, when you do this work, you find that uh, what you call borderline speech, which doesn't overtly and obviously cross the threshold of policies and community guidelines and uh, applicable frameworks for hate speech or, uh, or, or TVEC or terrorism on violent extremism content, um, that's, that's your problem. It's called borderline, you know, Zuckerberg in 2018 tried to address it. And the company's been trying to address it ever since. Um, a lot of the companies are trying to address this. And it's really tough to get right. Um, and so the daily presentation in the main of any issue, topic, frame, or focus um, at any given point of time on any platform is misinformation. It's quite an extraordinary thing to think about, actually. Um, and it's not immediately violative. So even if you report it, very often the case is that you get back a negative report, uh, case report file saying that actually this doesn't violate uh, our policies. Um, so we can talk about it more, but you know, if, you, if a user-generated report itself doesn't trigger uh, a violative um, uh, 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 threshold, then you can imagine how difficult it is for algorithms to manage this uh, tsunami of content, much of which is misleading and borderline. You know, in New Zealand, I thought that I'll be far removed from the challenges of Sri Lanka, but it turns out that actually things are quite dicey here too, but in different ways, obviously. So this German hacker called Ruf Schneier said, uh, you know, posited this idea of a hackable society. And it's not really about computer hacking, though he obviously comes from that background, but he talked about how society can be hacked. Uh, how through the rigging of elections and the questioning of electoral integrity, how through uh, the instrumentalization of anxiety around jobs and the markets and inflation, and whether you can afford petrol to go to work or to feed your kids, uh, how through the process of lawmaking, if not through the complete buyout of lawmakers, how through taxation and journalism, you can use society to rent asunder social structures. So it's a cancer from within, as opposed to say the kinetic hot war theater today in the Ukraine of a clear invasion from outside one's borders. Um, and I, I have added in the thesis or tried to add another element to this, which is attention hacking, because the greatest and rarest commodity that we all have individually or society has is attention. We have limited attention. And if you're able to grasp and sustain attention around that which is divisive and toxic and wrong and hurtful and harmful and hateful, then you have succeeded in many ways in undermining society, particularly over the longer term. And it works itself in different ways, online and offline, from the short to the medium to the long term. Uh, and so this concept of a hackable society, of course, in Sri Lanka, we don't have a state that really functions. So we kind of got used to dealing with a state that is broken. But it's a very, very different thing in New Zealand or in Switzerland, for example, when, you're, when you try to even consider and consider you must, I would argue, uh, a future where social and social cohesion and social structures are going to be eroded as a consequence of information disorders. And that is the goal of actors both within the country and outside of it uh, through attention hacking and what Bruce Schneier also refers to as a hackable society. So what I say is that, and the question often asked of me here in New Zealand is that, you know, can a high trust society be susceptible to this? And I say, actually can, because trust is not truth. In South Asia, we have what we call, and without, you know, it's not a pejorative term, it's a quite a loving term, we call it the auntie-uncle network of aunties and uncles, including my mother, for example, who constantly forward things to their children and grandchildren and their own, own peers that is completely utter bollocks. But they do it out of love. And because in South Asia, anybody with gray hair or any grandparent or any elder in society is extremely highly trusted, you conflate truth. And you tend to believe that people you trust are also the most 
uh, the people who are more, the most truthful. And you can, you, can, you can play with that if you are a disingenuous, insidious actor. And so high trust societies are also extremely susceptible to uh, the infodemic and the negative consequences. That's something that I try to flesh out as well. The other thing is that, you know, every time that I read about particular, and it's always, and again, no offense to those on the call, it always comes from the West about delete Facebook. You know, whenever there's a, whenever there's, you know, another Francis Haugen uh, revelation, uh, everybody says delete Facebook, you know, just get out of it. And, you know, I'm not against it. And I'm happy if you can do it. Um, and I would encourage you. Uh, it's just that I can't. And nobody in the global South can. Because it's inextricably entwined, for better or for worse, love, hate, or be indifferent to it, it's inextricably entwined into our social, political, cultural, economic, financial, and even uh, personal uh, DNA. Uh, everything from love and relationships and sex to geopolitics is integrally, in, in, inextricably entwined with these platforms and product surfaces. So, you know, I, I don't think that it's immediately obvious the degree to which these help as well as harm societies. So it's the antisocial and the pro-social. It's the, the helpful and the harmful. It's what is divisive and cohesive. It's what is fact and verified as well as mis and dis and malinformation and fiction. Um, all on the same product platform surfaces at the same time. It's a hell of a thing to study, actually. And of course, at different points of time, you know, different things happen and then you have uh, this contestation. Um, so in Sri Lanka, I, you know, there are several chapters devoted to some really bad stuff that happened in the course of my PhD studies, um, including some really, really bad uh, Islamophobia based violence against Muslims and other constitutional crises. And at all those times, even at the worst of times, there was still a lot of good on these platforms, a lot of help. And civil society and advocacy fighting back against all of what was going wrong also used the same platforms as the state used to engineer everything that could go wrong. So you have that uh, tension always, which doesn't really come across elsewhere in the reporting, which sees and projects and promotes this notion that, uh, for example, and for want of a better example, Meta or Facebook is evil. Uh, and there's nothing good that comes uh, out of it. And, and I know that that needs to be contested as well. The other thing is that, you know, in, in, again, I mean, it's all over the world, but it's very, very obvious in, in South Asia and in Sri Lanka is that there's a symbiotic relationship between online and offline. Um, some people refer to it as the real world. Uh, researchers like myself and others on this call don't. Because what is real is sometimes what is online and virtual and with ones and zeros as much as what is kinetic and based in the atomic world. Um, and so uh, to understand that, as well as to understand the degree to which what is online and how the ideation of violence translates into the enactment of violence and how the enactment of violent behavior translates into violative communications online and the symbiotic nature of that particularly in divided societies or with societies that have protracted ethnopolitical conflict or protracted humanitarian disasters is fundamentally important. And it goes back to my earlier point that you cannot really understand these things without locating them in a particular context. That photo, by the way, is the consequence of uh, significant rioting that occurred in March 2018 uh, as a consequence of social media amplifying at pace and very sharply uh, ethnopolitical tensions that have existed in the country for decades. Um, this is actually the time that I left for my PhD. So one of the ways it does this, and this is something that I discovered um, in Sri Lanka, it was the first of, I mean, my PhD is the first of its kind from the country. Uh, and so a lot of this was actually intuitively known, but you know, the process of doctoral research, as I'm sure Karsten would agree, helps you by confirming what you uh, intuitively knew or felt um, by affirming it in the data. And one of the things that I saw was, well, I mean, you could take it as frightening, but also fascinating is that social media can hack your circadian rhythm. So um, generally speaking, what I observed was that there's a pattern uh, that 
you can peg to the production of content at any given week or any given day. So you, you generally have a morning peak and afternoon peak during lunchtime, and then an evening peak. Um, so hypothetically, it could be seven o'clock in the morning when you're going to work, you're on social media and engaging with it, then you're doing it at lunchtime. And then you come back home and after dinner or supper, uh, and just before going to sleep, you then engage again. So there are three peaks a day. And uh, you see this in New Zealand as well. But when there is offline un unrest, it plateaus. It starts in the morning, does not let up, and it goes much further into the day and into the night. Um, and of course, social media companies love this because they see it as data points. The more engagement, the more profit. So they want to keep people coming and coming and coming. They give dopamine hits. And it's that algorithmic entrapment, as it were, uh, that keeps you bound to these platforms, products, and app surfaces. But during unrest, when you find that, the, you know, the academics call it emotional valence, which is a way of measuring what you feel. And on Facebook, for example, the happy or the sad uh, or the love or the care reactions are proxy indicators of what people go through. And what I found was that during times of unrest, people were angry and anxious and sad. I mean, depending on uh, the ethnic community uh, who was either the perpetrator or the victims from very early in the morning till very late at night. And by very late at night, I mean about midnight. So they start off anxious and they sleep anxious. And when you're talking about a societal level, so in Sri Lanka, we have about 8 million people on Facebook and you, know, you could measure it at scale. That's not a good thing. And you could also see certain people engineering it to be that way. They put up content that is Im immediately uh, sensational. So you immediately get angry or you immediately get sad or you immediately get worried. And that level of anxiety is sustained throughout the day. Uh, and that's not a good thing. Uh, and that's like being stressed continuously for days and days on end without necessarily knowing what is going on. So the hacking of the circadian rhythm, by the way, is happening in New Zealand. Uh, and that's some of the stuff that I've been doing since July last year. It seems to be a template for disinformation production and producers, as I said, to hack society, Schneier's term, including through the hacking of attention. Um, another thing that is very, very common in, in our markets, and I would assume in other markets as well, but I don't know, I can't say for certain, but it's very much the case in Sri Lanka and the Global South, is that you react without thinking. It's reflexive. You see something you like, you see something you share, it. you see something you comment on it and you don't think through it. And a lot of the content is designed to kind of generate that as well. So it's a reflexive reaction. It can be very, very problematic in divided societies um, with a longstanding ethnopolitical division and a proclivity towards violence. So uh, it's not a good thing, uh, but we find that social media really rewards you on immediacy, but has no reward a scheme or algorithmic benefit accrued as a consequence of engineering reflection. Um, and so it's immediacy over reflection and that has real consequences on society. Um, and as I said in that last bullet point, uh, in as much as could be determined, in Sri Lanka, it had spillover effects into offline consequences as well, which is not to say that there is a causal linkage. So it's not as simple as that, but over time, over time, the reflexive sharing shapes perceptions and behaviors, and it has offline spillover effects, which are not good. Um, Maria Ressa, the Nobel Peace Laureate for 2021, um, said that her country, the Philippines, and uh, I agreed with it entirely because my country and the Global South in general are petri dishes. And by petri dishes, we mean that what you guys face on the uh, other side of the world in the Global North is first trialed and tested with us because our markets really don't matter. <laughs> but because of the high density of usage, they are extremely useful to ascertain and to fine tune stuff that can be deployed on both sides of the Atlantic. And this is, by the way, not a figure of speech. You know, what we saw with Brexit, with the Trump election, with the 6th of January 2021 Capitol Hill insurrection with everything that has gone wrong and has been documented, including by Haugen over the course of last year, 
every story, every algorithmic harm, every manipulation of online uh, social media platforms we have seen. That's not an exaggeration. It's just that for a decade, nobody listened to us. In 2013, uh, I was responsible for the first report coming out of South Asia, looking at the platform instrumentalization, uh, instrumentalization of Facebook for ethnopolitical as well as religious extremism and harm. I didn't hear from, uh, from Facebook till March 2018. And that has been our story from our part of the world for, as I said, a decade. And if you look at now all of the books on Zuckerberg, the biographies on Zuckerberg, there's something very interesting. There's a common late motive, a common thread. That period was when the company was most interested in growth and nothing else. And you could see the consequences of that in my part of the world. So academics have, and those of you on the call would know a lot of terms that you use to kind of to, 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 to call out what, what, what these things are. Um, all of these we see in, in, in our part of the world and then see used at greater scope, speed and scale uh, deployed or employed for societal harms in the global north. Uh, and so it's that recognition that we have seen, we know, we have negotiated, we have studied, we have the data, and our lives are shaped by now which things that which are only talked about after, say, the capital insurrection, that is also something that the PhD tries to stress. Um, so a couple of things that, you know, I wanted to end with more broadly speaking, you know, one of the things that, that uh, the PhD looked at is that um, it raises questions around what can be done. What do we do? And a lot of what we do usually centers around fact-checking and debunking of myths and dis and malinfo um, and information dis disorders. And the argument goes that if you present, if, if the argument goes is that is the presentation of fact is able to kind of counter um, disbelief uh, in something factual or misbelief in something that is uh, fictive. Um, and, you know, Russia is doing this in the Ukraine in a very in in you know, insidious and in ingenious way where they are using fact-checking against itself. They're fact-checking their own false content. Um, and they're fact-checking it also by falsifying. It. So it, it really does your head in. But that is something that Russia is doing to undermine the trust in fact-checking itself. And that's an extraordinary thing, really. But what is more extraordinary is that my government and government proxies did this about two years ago, where they set up their own fact-checking enterprises to fact-check themselves so that the fact-checkers would be undermined because then you have a contestation of fact-checked stuff. And the point is that if everything is fact-checked and there's a contestation of facts and fact-checking, then you tend to not believe or not know to distinguish between what is actually fact-checked and what is falsified fact-checked. So can you, you know, just in terms of delineating and expressing the problem, if you're confused, you can imagine how powerful a method this is uh, to undermine um, the process through which many feel that the information disorder can be addressed, which is through more and strong and more broader and deeper and wider debunking and fact-checking enterprises. So, you know, the thesis complicates that. The other thing is that a lot of people, particularly in national security, think, tend to think that you know there are, there are different ways they look at it in terms of, the, they say stochastic violence or lone wolf terrorism or mass casualty terrorism. But generally speaking, it's to kind of look at it through the terrorist lens or terrorism lens. Now, I, I don't, I'm not saying that that's not valid and happy to talk about it. I come from the human security perspective. Uh, which is which is not, I mean, because natural security is why, you know, I have been hunted down in Sri Lanka. The national security argument frightens me. Um, whereas the human security argument um, is what interests me because human security, uh, you know, not just in humanitarian domains is, is, is fundamentally important. Um, and the point about disinformation is that it's not necessarily a terrorist act that it is engineering or engineered towards or intends to produce as an outcome. The volatility itself is the outcome. So the background here is a Jason Pollock painting. I love the painter. Uh, 
I miss New York and being able to see this at MoMA. Um, but you know, his paintings have what you call a high entropy value. You can't really make sense of it and you kind of tend to interpret it however you want to. Um, but you know, that the painting in the background kind of gives a sense of what disinformation does to society. It's a high entropic state that it leaves society in, which is very difficult to govern as a consequence. So the volatility is its own goal. And the enduring nature of those disorders is sometimes a strategic imperative and intent of disinformation, because it becomes very difficult, uh, difficult to uh, temper tempers and to calm a society and a population, particularly if you have a history of violence and social division and uh, contested histories like we have in the global south um, around things that can be emotive and lead to online and offline. Um, confrontations and antagonism. So the volatility, by the way, even here in New Zealand, is interestingly the engineering principle employed by disinformation. Terrorism is um, something that can happen and may happen and possibly will happen as a consequence, but I don't take a look at the studies uh, in that, in, in, in the TVEC, in the NATSEC, in the terrorism discourse uh, lens. Um, and, you know, the Washington Post yesterday, or at least my yesterday, uh, perhaps your today, uh, published a very interesting article, and it started off with this uh, long quote by Hannah Arendt. Uh, and that is really resonant because, I mean, it speaks to what I have tried to uh, highlight in the PhD and what society really is in the Global South and in Sri Lanka, where uh, it's, it's information disorders are a fact of life. It's not something new that came as a consequence of somebody in the West, uh, figuring out a new acronym for it or a new term for it. Um, this is what we've grown up with. In 1983, I remember some of my first memories were around what you would now call information disorders, which is the disconnect between what you're told and what you see and feel and hear and see. And so um, the thing about that is that, you know, today what Russia is trying to do in and around Ukraine and the debate and discourse around Ukraine is very much that at the global level, um, where you have uh, the complete projection of an unreal reality. Um, and you kind of try to kind of at pace engineer this such that the disorders become the new norm. And uh, there's a Dutch uh, psychologist, and I, I don't know how to pronounce this, I just, the last name, I just uh, call him for want of not wanting to insult him, Nico who I actually quote in my thesis. And uh, it's a fascinating thesis where he calls it the law of apparent realities in the backdrop, by the way, you recognize this from the 6th of January in Capitol Hill. And there's a lot of work done as to why people like Trump. It's an astonishing, extraordinary thing, really. Why do people like him? Why do people want to see him back in power? What is, what is that he controls their attention by? Because for every, by all metrics you would employ, this is not a healthy man. He's deeply unwell. Um, and yet he won a presidential term and he is a presidential aspirant by everything that we seem to read for the next presidential election and still commands a huge following. And of course, we have Duterte, we have Modi, we have Bolsonaro, we have populists, autocrats and authoritarians who are of the Trumpian mold. So why is that? And, you know, it comes back to what Nico says, which is around projecting reality to individuals who cannot any longer distinguish between what is imagined and what is real. It's a psychosocial disorder. The problem is, and it's really quite frightening, actually, where you have this called folia the, where it's a mass psychosis. It's a, you know, in any society, you have people who are psychotic, but what algorithms are doing is it's amplifying and it's also connecting those who are psychotic to create social media networks of psychosis that then infect broader and wider segments of society. It's a frightening thing, really. It's happened, it's never, it's unprecedented the degree to which it is happening. And again, while this is the norm in Sri Lanka, 
for a variety of reasons, also because we have a very violent history. It's also the case now in New Zealand. And what you see in the background, if I hope it plays without stuttering, is uh, the technical term is called murmuration. We tend to call it as, you know, refer to it as birds flocking. You know, shoals of fish do this as well. And I have always been fascinated, it's, you know, parenthetically and peripherally, uh, marginally captured in my thesis, but I've been fascinated by the degree to which this can help explain computationally what we see on social media around uh, myths and disinformation spread and genesis. I won't go into it in too much of detail, but just imagine if uh, you are searching for meaning and you don't have a way of understanding the world, what does missing forgive you? It's like a cult. Missing forgives you a way of understanding the world. Mr. Trump gives you a way of understanding the world that is simple. People of my color are bad. People across the border from Mexico are bad. They're taking away your jobs and they are not making America great. So people of my color, and particularly if I'm Muslim, I have to be eliminated one way or the other by getting rid of me if I'm in the country or by not allowing me into the country. That's a simple message. And if you're somebody who is hungry, is jobless and is anxious and doesn't understand the world and is also not conforming to a faith-based tradition, uh, then myths and disinformation gives you a way of understanding the world. It's just like murmuration. It surrounds you with people who think like you and it makes you believe that you're not alone. Very, very dangerous thing. It goes back to that shared psychosis model. So. Just to end, where, where are we going with all of this? I will not leave you with anything hopeful and positive, but of course, there, as I said, there's always a contestation. Um, these are some of the ideas that I think will shape the world as uh, we will all encounter it and negotiate it wherever we are, whether it's in Zurich or whether it's in Colombo or Colombia or Canada or New Zealand or Delhi. Um, I think decentralized financing is going to be a problem through cryptocurrency based funding of disinformation producers and productions such that it's going to be impossible to determine who is funding what, where, how, and when. And we see this, it's not science fiction. It's not a frontier uh, challenge. We saw this with the convoy in Canada, in Ottawa, where the Canadian government clamped down on cryptocurrency based funding because they felt that it was coming out of the country and from sources that they thought were national security risks. Um, uh, with decentralized and distributed um, platform product services, you know, I'm, I won't go into technical details, but you're moving away from the Facebooks and the Twitters, and even with the Twitters, with a project called, some of you may know, Blue Sky, go Google it if you want. Twitter wants to set up a new decentralized platform for Twitter. Um, and once that happens, you're not going to have a, one company and one Twitter. You're going to have a multiple uh, permutations of Twitter. Uh, not unlike uh, some of you may be familiar with the platform called Discord. So again, I mean, it speaks to my age, but I remember a time where you have bulletin board systems where you dialed up with a modem. So this is going back a while. So we are going back into the future where you're going to have social media like bulletin boards. Where it's going to be decentralized and pretty much the, the laws, the applicable regulations and laws and oversight mechanisms are going to be with the person who created it. So it's going to be an absolute nightmare for governance. It's going to be encrypted. So researchers like myself and no governments um, will be able to know what exactly is going on and how. Um, and that's that 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 fourth bullet point, I think, is 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 something that is that surprises many. I've told it to because you see democratization as an inherent good. The demos, democracy is seen as an inherent good. But my point is that easier access and the lowering of the barriers to access means that more and more people coming on and using it, using these products and platforms in ways that you never intended are going to bring problems. This is what Facebook went through from 2012 to 2018. It's going to happen all over again with uh, the decentralized platform services that are springing up, leading to new economies of hate, hurt, and harm, and new ecologies of misinformation. Any one of these is a challenge, all of them, which we are going to be faced with in any one market is going to be something that regulatory and legislative mechanisms and the policymakers, whether they are in the Swiss government, whether they're in the New Zealand government or Singapore or Delhi or Colombo are going to be faced with 
having to deal with. And um, I would argue that in Sri Lanka, without wanting to insult the rest of the countries, uh, they're simply not fit for purpose. They don't understand what is going on today, much less what is on the screen that will come about. So I want to leave you with two ideas, the, at, at, you know, great violence, of course, to the nuance that can be applied. How, do you do, how, how can you address all of this? Some of you may know of the Prince Rupert drop, um, that glass ball, which is on a long string. Um, it's an it's, it's incredible thing because you can't destroy the head of that glass bubble. Uh, and there are some videos, if you go and take a look, uh, it can withstand a direct hit from a bullet and the bullet disintegrates, but not the glass bubble. So it's extraordinarily strong. Um, the way you destroy a Prince Rupert's drop head is to cut off its tail. And again, go to Google and, and you know, look at the, the videos of it. It's, it's an extraordinary thing. So social media regulation can also look at it in two ways. You can cut off the head of the snake. You can control the generative sources of hurt, hate, and harm, and mis and mal and disinfo. And in any country, you have super spreaders, any country. In fact, the CCDH came up with the super spreaders in the United States linked to the pandemic. In New Zealand, I have identified super spreaders. In any country, you have power law dynamics that give rise to super spreaders. You contain and control and curtail them, and the harms are then also constrained but you can also look at what you call long tail engagement. You stop the engagement of harm. And you know, in regulatory mechanisms and also in algorithmic mechanisms and uh, the ways in which you can do this in the real world on the platforms, this is actually a very sophisticated discussion that I'm using Prince Rupert's drop to help explain. So you can cut off the head or you can cut off engagement and you can play around with those two uh, levers as it were. And the last slide is something that I've coined. It's called virtuous viscosity. For those of you who know a little bit of physics, viscosity is to make a liquid thicker so that something, you know, like those balls in the background in vials of oil, the thicker the liquid, the slower, the greater the friction and the something spreads. Um, so you can also do this algorithmically. You can also do it through human oversight. You can also do it offline through education and uh, progressive policy making, uh, including through progressive media. Um, but essentially, it's to stop the easy spread of harmful, toxic content. That's not a that's not an easy challenge, um, and companies are trying to do this. Um, but I have always advocated for regulatory mechanisms and regulatory conversations and algorithmic solutions to what we see is going wrong by increasing the friction. And by that, I also mean by containing the reach of harmful content. So everybody can say whatever they want, but the most harmful toxic content doesn't reach uh, a, a lot of people. So you constrain the reach of harmful toxic content and not necessarily by trying to deplatform those voices. And I go back to where I started. This requires a contextual grounded approach. It requires what I call an ecological approach, you know, like my background on Zoom. It requires you to understand how things grow, what the underlying soil is, where the well springs are, what is fertilizing, um, how things are growing um, in relation to each other and locating harms in those contexts and the nurture and nature of mis, mal, and disinformation, which I've done in Sri Lanka and as a consequence of doctoral research, but also for years and years of working with Daniel and Maria with the foundation and the work that we have done predating the, the, the pandemic and predating my doctoral research. What I have tried to articulate in this presentation is what we have tried to do for many, many years. That's what I'd like to leave you with. You know, that, you know, that image I, I picked because it, it um, speaks to Carl Sagan's wonderful quote uh, where he spoke of us as a, a moat of dust suspended in a, in a, in a, in a, in a beam of uh, sunlight. And that bright dot, I don't know whether you can see it, is Earth. This is Venus leaving us. Uh, what was our, rather, Voyager leaving us. And it's a wonder, it's a, it's a, it's a NASA poster. And it always puts things into perspective. Uh, uh, you know, for me at least, uh, and that our struggles daily to make uh, the world a better place than we inherited it 
and to be better ancestors to our future self needs to be placed in perspective and these are hard things that we try to do we'll never do it by the end of our lives but we must always try to do it that is what's important uh, and i suppose i'll i'll, I'll leave it at that cast and open it up for questions